with the MCS 90 endorsement. To begin, I'd like to tell you just a little bit about, my, about myself and why I'm qualified to speak on this topic. Uh, my name's Ashton Kirsch, and I'm an attorney with the law firm of Matisse and Wickert and Lair. Uh, our firm is a leading subrogation law firm, and we handle all lines of insurance subrogation claims in all 50 U.S. states. Uh, I'm confident that most of you on this webinar are probably very familiar with our firm as clients uh, or so forth, and have used our website, our books, our numerous charts, or other resources that we provide to the claims industry. Uh, a bit more about me, uh, I specialize in transportation litigation, focusing in on the subrogation of large loss trucking, marine cargo, and interstate transportation claims. Uh, this would be claims involving the MCS 90 endorsement, uh, CARMAC for cargo, uh, COGSA, uh, and so forth. Uh, in my practice, I've developed a very strong understanding of the MCS 90 endorsement and other, fe other, other federal mandates that influence the trucking industry and have litigated and recovered on dozens, uh, countless of MCS 90 cases throughout the United States in both subrogation, reimbursement, and coverage issues. Uh, further, I've spent the past number of years traveling around the country, speaking at conventions, conferences, and uh, providing webinars such as this one on MCS 90 endorsement and the best claims practices in handling transportation claims. Uh, finally, uh, I've answered countless questions, probably from many of you in attendance and other adjusters across the country. And uh, these numerous questions on the MCS 90 endorsement is really what caused me to create this presentation. Uh, a synopsis of the law and the basis for bringing these claims. So now uh, let's move forward and go into the topic at hand. Uh, why am I presenting on this topic and why are you all logged into this webinar? Uh, I've developed these materials in order to provide you, the subrogation professional adjuster, with an understanding of MCS 90 and how to use this to increase your recoveries. Uh, the purpose of this presentation is to, one, help to expand your knowledge on transportation claims in general, how to assert a claim, uh, negotiate a claim, uh, or even defend a claim. Uh, two, we'll focus and learn the intricacies of the MCS 90 endorsement, uh, why it exists. Uh, we'll review the historical context that gave rise to its development. Uh, we'll review the pragmatic application of the endorsement. Uh, how does MCS 90 influence your day-to-day -day claims handling? Uh, we'll review the effect on the trucking industry. How does MCS 90 and certain financial responsibility rules affect the entire trucking claims industry and safety professionals? Uh, three, we're going to discuss and learn how the MCS 90 endorsement uh, creates kind of a quasi-coverage. Uh, noting that the idea of created coverage is actually just a term of art, and we're actually stating this to say that it's an actual surety relationship, quasi-coverage, where payment can be made by a third-party insurance carrier. Uh, four, we'll analyze these claims to help you to understand the right to reimbursement after MCS 90 is paid. Uh, this will be transitioning halfway through the presentation from subrogation claims on behalf of injured parties or injured insurance carriers who have paid benefits to those parties uh, to actually uh, bringing a reimbursement claim on behalf of the carrier who pays out under MCS 90. And five, I'll provide you here with numerous tricks, tips, and resources that you can apply to all of your litigated matters. Uh, with that said, let's take another sneak peek at what will be covered and how we're gonna go about this presentation. Uh, this presentation will discuss in detail the regulatory backdrop of the 20th century interstate commerce regulations. Uh, we'll discuss those historical regulations that actually gave rise to MCS 90 and public financial responsibility rules. Uh, we'll go through the how, the why, the where, and the when to apply MCS 90 claims. Uh, we'll discuss how to analyze MCS 90 claims and assess coverage and how to use MCS 90 to recover on a seemingly dead claim in case, uh, and relatedly, how to recover if the carrier then pays out under MCS 90. And finally, as time permits, we'll hit some of those questions 
and, uh, and try to give you our thoughts. Uh, understand that this presentation today is really a snapshot. It's a synopsis of an area of law that could take hours to go over. Uh, so we approach it accordingly and try to just hit the tip of the iceberg so that you understand uh, what MCS 90 is and can apply this and know where to look for future claims handling. So let's dive in. Introducing MCS 90. Now the all important question, uh, what is the MCS 90 endorsement? Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the endorsement, MCS 90 is an insurance policy endorsement that's used by motor carriers to comply with the federally mandated liability requirements placed upon them. Uh, for the purpose of this presentation, we're gonna mention motor carrier is referring to both private and public trucking companies. What the endorsement does is requires the insurance carrier that issues the endorsement to pay on any judgment that is obtained against their insured that arises from negligent damage to property, persons, or the environment even when that loss would not otherwise be covered by the terms of the policy. In short, the endorsement is meant to shift that risk of loss uh, from the public, the innocent public, and back to the trucking company or their insurance carrier by guaranteeing that an injured party is going to have a means to recovery, an ability to, uh, to be made right, even when the trucking company has no money and the insurance carrier for that trucking company as a valid exclusion or basis to deny their coverage. Uh, meaning that the insurance carrier must then step up and pay a judgment even when they're insured, that trucking company is not able to, and the terms of the policy don't allow for coverage. Uh, what this endorsement does is it supersedes and trumps the terms of the policy and that coverage exceptions and exemptions are no longer applied and the liability and responsibility to pay under MCS 90 still remains. In other words, as we continue to go through the same issue, this endorsement creates a surety relationship whereby an injured party should in most situations have a way to recover when they are injured by the negligence of an interstate motor carrier. Now, I'm a student of history and uh, in in being so, I find it hugely important to understand the historical context of any issue in order to really and truthfully grasp uh, its later developments. Uh, accordingly, in order for us to really understand the significance of the MCS 90 endorsement and public responsibility rules, uh, it's essential that we understand how it came about and developed. Uh, that's what we'll discuss in this slide. Uh, from the 1800s until about the 1970s, the federal government was engaged and a constant expansion of regulation that we saw throughout the economy, and this specifically involved interstate commercial relations. Uh, the move towards regulation had been ongoing for some time, but the real starting point uh, was with the passage of uh, an act called the Interstate Commerce Act, the ICA, also known as of 1887. What the ICA did is it was a law created, an act created to combat the monopolistic practices found in the railroad industry. Uh, the railroads had been constantly increasing rates. Uh, they'd been using unfair trade practices to limit competition and uh, collaborating amongst each other inappropriately to increase prices to consumers. Uh, the general idea of the ICA was that they could force the railroads to charge a reasonable and just rate and to squash the price collusion and anti-competitive elements in the industry. Uh, it was a very novel idea, great for the industry. So throughout the 1900s and early 1900s, regulation continued to expand as they expanded upon the ICA and uh, government uh, politicians continued to grasp for more and more power as they continued to influence the economy. And this was consistently supported by the US Supreme Court. Uh, Meaningful to our analysis was the next change that occurred in 1935 when Congress amended the ICA to specifically regulate motor carriers, that would be trucking companies. Uh, the goal of this was twofold. One, they wanted to make the ICA applicable to assure reasonable rates were used in the trucking industry, and two, to place the railroad and trucking businesses on an equal regulatory footing. So, 1935, trucks begin to be regulated per the ICA, 
and federal rules. Uh, with the regulation now applied to all forms of transportation, the regulations continued to expand. Government got more and more involved, more hands went into the pod, and the web for compliance with certain regulations became even more difficult. Uh, in short, by the 1960s, the industry for transportation and trucking specifically was a red tape nightmare. Uh, the ability to operate it as a common carrier or a trucking company had, was only limited to huge companies that could afford to have a staff of a many lawyers, many compliance folks that could go out there and make sure that they applied, complied with all different laws and regulations. Uh, 1970s, this began to change. Washington realized their folly and they started a process of general deregulation in the end to increase and support the business climate. Uh, the process of deregulation for our sake uh, really hit its climax with the passage of the Motor Carriers Act of 1980, also known as the MCA. Uh, the MCA was a federal law which was enacted to deregulate and increase competition in the trucking industry. Uh, this law created widespread, huge and sweeping changes that sent waves throughout the field. Uh, I don't often quote Jimmy Carter, but Jimmy Carter did sign the bill and he stated uh, in quotes, that this is historic legislation, it will be removed, it will remove 45 years of excessive and inflationary government restriction and red tape. It will have a powerful anti-inflationary effect, reducing consumer costs by as much as $8 billion and conserving annually hundreds of millions of gallons of fuel. Uh, consumers will benefit because almost every product we purchase is shipped by truck and outmoded regulations have inflated prices that we must pay each day. The trucking industry will benefit greatly. Uh, those are the words of Jimmy Carter. Uh, keep in mind that prior to the MCA, the inefficiencies in this system were glaring. Um, motor carriers would have to apply and obtain authority to go on certain transportation routes on which they would then hold a monopoly. Uh, what this would mean though, is that oftentimes a load would have to be transported, cargo would be carried hundreds of miles in a totally opposite direction just to comply with set routes. Uh, an example being that a load going from Miami to New Orleans may need to go up through Atlanta just to comply with routes. Uh, a load from Chicago to Milwaukee may need to go through St. Louis. Uh, these inefficiencies caused major issues and that was one of the purpose of the MCA. Uh, the MCA specifically, uh, the change allowed carriers to publish their own rates and price within a zone of reasonableness. Uh, it also added flexibility into the negotiation of service arrangements and gave a lot more leeway to companies to actually decide where they wanted to transport and how to transport. And all in all, the MCA streamlined the process of compliance and allowed it much, it made it much easier for smaller, uh, less funded trucking companies to join the industry. Uh, by reducing these barriers, the trucking industry flourished, it exploded, and countless smaller companies formed and began to operate. Uh, this reduced the prices to consumers and thereby created a, I mean, created a system of uh, positive uh, system that made, had a ton of small trucking companies come about, increasing the number of trucks on the road. This resulted in obvious probabilities of greater accidents with different trucks that may have less responsive financial ability. <clears throat> as is seldom the case, as we get through this history, the federal government actually anticipated the unintended consequences of the MCA. Uh, they realized that the additional trucks in smaller motor carriers would lead to more accidents, and specifically, more of those accidents with underfunded uh, parties that were at fault. So the MCA initiated additional safety requirements to counter these issues. Importantly, and important to our MCS 90 consideration, the act required that interstate motor carriers carry a set minimum level of liability coverage to protect the public from the influx of these small underfunded truckers on the road. Uh, specifically, the MCA required that the carrier obtain minimum liability coverage in one of three ways. One, the motor carrier can obtain an insurance policy that obtained and that included an MCS 90 endorsement. So one, 
an MCS-90 endorsement. Two, for those larger motor carriers, they could have a policy of, well, a policy of self-insurance. They could have self-insurance if they had the requisite monetary capacity. And three, the carrier could have a qualifying surety bond. In short, the MCA required that motor carriers who would operate interstate, that's between more than two states, would have to have one of these three public financial responsibility forms of compliance in order to operate. Uh, while all three options, as discussed, the surety bond, the self-insurance, and the MCS-90 endorsement do comply with the federal regulations, uh, by far the most common would be through MCS-90 compliance, and that's why we bring this presentation forward. That's what we're going to discuss for the remainder of this PowerPoint. Now, as we've discussed, the MCA and federal liability rules set various financial responsibility requirements on carriers, specifically requiring a certain amount of public liability coverage based on the type of product being transported. So the extent of public liability coverage that needs to be had by that trucking company to get operational authority is based on the size of the truck and the type of, of cargo being moved. These requirements vary from a low of $750,000 for standard transport to a high of $5 million for more hazardous products. Uh, the next slide here, we're gonna look at the actual schedule of limits. Uh, the chart here is the most recent schedule of limits as released by the FMCSA, which would be the, uh, the administrative authority handling these claims, the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administrations, ex ad ad Administration. Uh, these rules here may not include all relevant liability limits as there are additional requirements for those who transport people rather than pro product, uh, but those could be subject to another rule. Uh, notice how this chart outlines the type of carriage. We see that it's based on the weight of the vehicle, and then this correlates to the type of commodity being moved, the type of cargo, in order to determine the dollar value that is required for those limits. Uh, accordingly, there's two major considerations here. One, the weight of the vehicle, and two, the type of cargo moved. Uh, I'd first look at the first subset uh, for four hire vehicle, uh, this includes vehicles with a weight over 10,000 pounds and carrying non-hazardous materials. This would be your standard trucking company, the standard over-the-road trucker. Uh, as you can see on the right, this carrier would be subject to $750,000 limits, meaning that they'd need to obtain a minimum of $750,000 in coverage through MTS-90 or one of the other means of compliance. Uh, second, we see those vehicles that are similarly situated in weight, uh, but carry hazardous materials. Uh, these substances would be fertilizers, pressurized gases, uh, radiological material, radioactive materials. Uh, obviously, those materials that have a much greater cleanup cost for environmental damages. Uh, for those, we're looking at $5 million limits. Uh, third, we see a lesser version of the hazardous materials for $1 million in liability limits. Uh, this would be uh, those carrying oil or certain less hazardous materials. And finally, we look at four. Uh, this is a section that just correlates uh, hazardous material rules in two to vehicles that weigh less than 10,000 pounds. Uh, all in all, these schedules are important to monitor and really to understand uh, because this sets what your requisite limit would be under MCS 90. If you have an over-the-road trucking company transporting between two states and they're in compliance, you bring a claim against them, more than likely if they're transferring non-hazardous materials, they will have an MCS-90 endorsement providing for $750,000 in coverage. Now on to the actual endorsement language. Uh, the MCS-90 endorsement reads, in consideration of the premium stated in the policy to which this endorsement is attached, the insurer agrees to pay within the limits of liability described herein any final judgment recovered against the insured for public liability resulting from negligence in the operation, maintenance, or use of motor vehicles subject to the financial responsibility requirements of the MCA regardless of whether or not each motor vehicle is specifically described in the policy, 
and whether or not such negligence occurs on any route or in any territory authorized to be served by the insured or elsewhere. In short, this endorsement, the language, describes exactly what we've been discussing, that despite policy provisions to the contrary, the MCS 90 endorsement will act to create a, a quasi-coverage uh, responsibility to pay a judgment and mandated reimbursement under certain situations. Uh, something to quickly be touched upon is once a policy is itch, issued under MCS 90, uh, it must be filed with the federal government, with the FMCSA. Uh, accordingly, all of these forms, all filings are in most scenarios public record. So whenever you get a case involving trucking companies, uh, typically we'll Google FMCSA filings and so forth to see uh, what insurance carriers they have listed and what type of coverage we're looking at. Uh, with a simple understanding of where the endorsement stems from, uh, now we can actually move forward and discuss how we apply MCS 90 to claims and actual injuries. So when does MCS 90 apply? I'd continue to drill into your mind throughout this presentation that MCS 90 is exceptionally easy to evaluate. Uh, it just becomes more complex when you get into the various issues and background information. Uh, there's really three main things you need to consider in proving any MCS 90 claim. Those elements are one, was the load being transported interstate? That is between two or more states. Uh, interestingly, uh, this could be a whole nother presentation. Some circuits have actually interpreted this to mean that shipments that are bound under a bill of lading for another state, but the injury occurs within the first state may still be subject to these rules. Uh, case by case basis for you, that gets a bit more complex than our uh, discussion today. But just keep in mind, interstate, two or more states. Two, is the truck driver negligent in causing this accident? And did this negligence actually cause the injury? Uh, in short, can you prove a third party claim? Three, is the accident somehow excluded from coverage within the policy? Uh, the basis for such an exclusion uh, may vary, uh, but Common examples would be, one, is there an exclusion for environmental damage, maybe a pollutant exclusion? Uh, is there a non-listed auto exclusion? Was the, did the accident that occur occur with a vehicle that the owner of the company or some employee forgot to actually list with the insurance company? And also, and finally, cancellation. Uh, a policy has to be canceled under certain ways per the FMCSA that are more stringent than typically contractual issues with your insurance company. Uh, under the MCS, uh, under MCS 90, the insured must be given at least 35 days notice of cancellation. Uh, the FMCSA provides for 30 days. If that notice is not provided, then it could well be that the policy is canceled for purpose of coverage and actually under the terms of the policy for the insured, the trucking company, but MCS 90 liability and obligations may still be in existence. So in summary, if, driver, if the driver was one, operating interstate, two, was negligent, and three, coverage is denied for one of these reasons, then you may very well have an MCS 90 claim and an ability to assert this against that trucking company and insurance carrier. Now we understand, you know, we've discussed the elements necessary to prove your claim. So let's shift our focus and discuss a few of those practical issues uh, that come into play when bringing your claim. Uh, first off, it's important to recognize that an insurance carrier with an MCS 90 endorsement has a duty to satisfy any judgment brought against them per MCS 90 against the trucking company. However, they don't have a policy or contractual obligation to actually defend their insured. Uh, that's a distinction worth mentioning because it, they don't have that obligation, but any carrier would be uh, completely insane to not defend their insured with the reservation of those scenarios, because obviously then they'd be able to obtain a judgment and enforce that, uh, have that enforced against them. So practically speaking, all of these MCS 90 claims uh, look about the same. We have a trucking company where we pursue a claim against the trucking company, uh, coverage is denied, we get a denial letter from the trucking company saying we don't have coverage here. We then review the bill of lading, see that it was an interstate load, 
uh, bring a claim against the trucking company and send a letter to their carrier. I explained that we believe they should have MCS 90 coverage here. Typically, that would be the case, at which point uh, usually the adverse carrier with that MCS 90 endorsement would be willing to come forward, provide a defense, and or discuss settlement. Uh, considering these practical situations, it's really often the case that we can bring the adverse carrier directly in earlier and attempt to settle these things. Uh, keeping in mind that most adverse adjusters we speak to on these issues, upon us uh, providing documentation that they should have MCS 90 coverage or some sort of uh, extra coverage here, uh, they'll play stupid. It's not uncommon for them to pretend that they have no idea what MCS 90 is, that they don't know that these ex claims even exist, and uh, kind of stonewall you on it. Accordingly, we tell all of our clients who handle these cases uh, that they need to be organized. You should, one, identify the carrier as soon as possible. Two, notify this carrier of your claim. Once coverage is denied, notify them and provide them a detailed memo outlining what an MCS 90 claim is, why you believe that their policy would have this endorsement, and so forth. Uh, when you provide these explicit explanations of MCS 90, you're going to be showing the adverse adjuster that you know your stuff. And uh, just remember that these adverse adjusters are oftentimes trained to act that way. Uh, often, usually a claim will be asserted against their insured, they'll deny for lack of coverage, then the claim will disappear. Uh, thankfully, following this presentation and the goal of this presentation is to give each of you, the listener, the attendee, uh, the background information to at least have this perk up, something perk up in your mind to think, okay, it's been denied, this was an interstate load, we may have a right to recover, there may be an MCS 90 claim here. Uh, that's MCS 90 in a nutshell. Uh, the remainder of this presentation will continue to review these issues and look a little bit more in depth. Uh, important to our considerations and something I always give in all my presentations for uh, trucking related losses is some scope as to uh, the nature of the trucking industry. To grasp the importance here, the extent of claims we really need to take into account uh, the state of the U.S. trucking industry specifically. Uh, I have little doubt many people here listening to this presentation have spent countless hours sitting on a file, working it up, and then realizing that the trucking company you're pursuing just has no resources. Uh, a few interesting statistics to keep in mind as to the immense size and number of carriers is that 80% uh, of all U.S. cargo in the United States, in the United States is transported by truck. This is accounting for $726 billion in revenue just in trucking alone. Uh, in the U.S., there are 1.3 million trucking companies, and 90% of these companies have fewer than six trucks. Uh, this is a huge statistic for, MCS, for MCS 90 claims, given the fact that we're looking at that many small trucking companies that typically aren't going to have the resources in order to satisfy any claim beyond the coverage that they have. Uh, equally staggering is the fact that 6% of the population in the United States works in some way within the trucking industry, which makes truck driving the most common occupation in 29 U.S. states. Uh, beyond this, U.S. trucks drive 432 billion miles, which would be the distance from here to Pluto going back and forth 25 times. I uh, believe that's each year. In short, trucking industry is immense. There's more and more trucks on the road every year, making MCS 90 claims just that much more important. Uh, beyond the sheer size is the extent of damage caused by these trucks. In 2017, 40,000 people died in car crashes and 4.6 million people were injured, uh, costing $432 billion. Uh, in it creates an incredibly dangerous scenario when we have more and more of these trucks on the road and they have less and less uh, funds available to satisfy any injuries. So MCS 90 comes into play and we see every year more and more claims be, in, being asserted there under. So now I believe in any MCS 90 example, uh, it's very helpful to actually look at a 
a common scenario or an example to give you a true understanding of uh, how this plays out. Now, the example I like to provide is by an introduction to my good friend, uh, though imaginary friend, Joe Trucker. I want you to imagine Joe. He's a long haul trucker. He's carried loads for two decades, uh, 20 years. This has been his life, I mean, his career. And one morning he just wakes up and realizes, you know, enough is enough. I'm done driving for other people. I'm doing this myself. So Joe decides I'm starting my own company. So he goes out to the local Peterbilt dealer and buys an old tractor, uh, goes to the cell phone store, opens a checking account with a few bucks, uh, goes out and obtains all necessary licenses, and then goes along to his local insurance agent and requests a qualifying insurance policy. Uh, he creates a company called JT Trucking, LLC, obtains the necessary legal documents through a legal website, and with his insurance policy in hand, ensures that he has an MCS 90 endorsement and he's up and running. He has insurance, he has a bank account, he has an LLC, that's what he needs. So Joe's good and running and he immediately begins leasing himself out and carrying loads for other similarly uh, financially situated companies. Now on the fatal day for our example, Joe's hired, let's imagine that Joe's hired to carry a load of tires to a neighboring state. On the morning of the pickup, Joe goes out to go get his mail, to go pick up the newspaper, uh, coffee in hand, it slips on ice, injuring his leg. Uh, Joe realizes that he still has a job to do, he has a new company, uh, and he can't just not be showing up to pick up loads. So he calls his buddy Mark, who also has been a trucker, and asks Mark to come and help him handle the load of tires. Uh, Mark shows up to Joe's, uh, picks up the tractor, and hits the road to go pick up the load of tires. Uh, he picks up the load, begins the trip, and while driving down the road after crossing into a neighboring state, uh, Mark falls asleep behind the wheel and neg negligently crashes into a car being driven by our example par party, Patty Plaintiff. Now imagine Patty's car is totally destroyed, and she's lucky to even be alive. She's rushed to the hospital and has to undergo emergency surgeries, costing significant amounts of money and medical bills. When all said and done, we have about $50,000 for a new destroyed car and about uh, 100, 150,000 in medical bills. So a few weeks later, Patty hires an attorney who asserts a claim against JT Trucking for $200,000 for the personal injury. So we have two claims here. We have claim for property damage of $50,000 and a $200,000 $200, bodily injury demand. So Joe's sitting at his home office a few weeks later, reading his mail, and uh, he reads this demand letter from Patty Plaintiff's attorney. Uh, thankfully, he remembers, I have an insurance policy. I have this policy through truck and stuff insurance. So he calmly emails the agent, scans in a copy of the demand, and sends it off, hoping a claim will be quickly opened and Truck and Stuff will step in and resolve this. Uh, the adjuster with Truck and Stuff would then receive the demand, investigates the claim, and then realizes that Mark was driving this vehicle, caused the damage, and he's not a covered person or not listed on this policy. So Truck and Stuff promptly denies the claim for lack of coverage and steps out of it. Accordingly, our buddy Joe's in a rough spot. He has no insurance coverage for the loss, and he has absolutely no assets to pay the demand. So quick thinking Joe, as would be most companies in his situation, changes his cell phone number, closes his bank account, and begins operating under a new entity, JT2 Trucking. Uh, otherwise, he just goes out of business and disappears off the map, as would be typical of these claims. So now Patty is out of luck. Uh, she, thankfully, she has first party coverage for the auto damage through ABC Insurance, who pays for the 50,000 in damage and asserts a subrogation claim. Uh, but what do they do now? They recognize JT Trucking's uncollectible and unable to pay or even you know, partially pay any sort of judgment. Plus, even if they could go after Joe individually, he's got nothing worth pursuing. Uh, accordingly, they're stuck with really few options. Uh, but thankfully, the ABC adjuster had recently been on a webinar regarding the MCS 90 endorsement and remembered that there may be something there. Uh, he explains to, uh, the, to Patty Plaintiff's attorney that this is an interstate trucking load 
and that JT Trucking likely had an MTS 90 endorsement through Truck and Stop Insurance. Accordingly, they work together, team up, and assert a claim against the insurance carrier Truck and Stop, demanding payment and threatening to pursue a claim and get, obtain a judgment against their insured. Uh, Truck and Stuff initially refused to settle, so ABC and Patty Plaintiff both file suit against JT Trucking and obtain a judgment against JT. Uh, with this judgment in hand, they go to Truck and Stuff, provide them this judgment, threaten to enforce it, and the world's made right. Truck and Stuff pays the $250,000, and the MCS 90 claim has been collected upon. I understand that that's a very long example and thorough given the facts, but it, I think it's helpful to envision these things actually playing out because so many of these cases, while the facts remain different, uh, they play out in the same way. They have different facts, but the same pretty, pretty much structure here. To recap, MCS 90 uh, can be used as a tool to create this seemingly quasi coverage uh, or right to reimbursement and facilitate a recovery even against a defunct and now out of business motor carrier. Uh, as we saw with Joe Trucker, uh, Joe would never have had enough assets to pay a $250,000 demand. However, under MCS 90, ABC and Patty were able to substantiate and make a full recovery. Uh, I like to break down the properly handled claims into a few steps uh, for your assistance. One, Assess your claim against the negligent trucking company and review any associated companies, brokers, and so forth. Uh, remember that when you first get these files, you should be conducting an in-depth review or an in-depth review, asset check, and so forth. Uh, you can Google these companies through the uh, FMCSA and find details on their operational status and so forth. Uh, it's good to do this early because before they're out of business or try to escape the claim you can usually get the most information and kind of garner whether you're going to be pursuing them individually or if MCS 90 is your only source of recovery. Uh, two, you should ascertain the identity of the insurance carrier through an ISO, police report review, or some sort of online search to see if you can find out who that carrier is early on in the process. Uh, and uh, uh, arguably making them more willing to come to the table. Uh, six, you're gonna bring the judgment against the insurance carrier and demand judgment if they won't settle. And seven, settle with the adverse carrier. Eight, if they refuse to settle, get this with counsel because you can enforce that judgment and force that insurance carrier to reimburse you under the MCS 90 endorsement. Further, always consider retaining counsel early in the process uh, because this will allow con uh, the attorneys to build a consistent case and hopefully resolve the process early. Now, we're about half, we're a little bit over halfway through, so I do want to touch upon that trivia question for the uh, free book. Um, uh, once I give you this question, provide your answer through the question pane on your dashboard. The first one to answer this question correctly is gonna win an MWL book of your choice. Uh, we'll reveal the winner at the end of the webinar and Jamie Breen with our office will email the winner after the webinar to figure out what book you may want. And the question for today is, what is the state that has the highest number of fatal automobile accidents involving trucks? I'll repeat that again. What is the state that has the highest number of 
fatal accidents involving trucks. And we'll hit that one at the end of the presentation to go over the correct answer. Now, as explained earlier and back to the presentation, uh, some strategies for pursuing your claim. Uh, this presentation is solely a primer, so anything we cover is just meant to give you that introduction. And the eight steps previously mentioned will be helpful in your handling, but always remember that you should take your time to review each claim as is and refresh yourself on the relationship between MCS 90 and that specific claim. Also, always expand upon the need to, uh, to put these memos together to have an actual uh, be it research, information on MCS 90 so that you can provide that to the other side. Uh, these adverse adjusters, if there's one thing I've learned in the handling of these cases, is it's, it's surprising how little some of these liability adjusters for the actual insurance carriers with the trucking companies know on these claims. As mentioned, their strategy is either to play dumb or be dumb, and they're not going to pay or even acknowledge existence of MCS 90. Uh, until one, you've really proven that you know it's in there in their policy, or two, suits filed. So always take your time, provide those memos, and uh, work with the adverse adjuster to make sure that you have all that information out there. Now, we've discussed everything with MCS 90 subrogation. So now we're going to kind of turn this claim on its head. And we're going to have a quick discussion now on MCS 90 reimbursement. Uh, when I say MCS 90 reimbursement, I'm referring to the process by which an insurance carrier who's paid out under MCS 90 may thereafter pursue their own insured and demand repayment since these funds were paid outside of the policy. Uh, in short, with MCS 90, the payment to that third party, the payment to Patty Plaintiff and ABC, uh, were, was not per the terms of the policy. There was no contractual obligation per the policy terms to have those funds paid, meaning that there is a right here to pursue the insured for making that payment. It's a surety relationship. It's not an actual coverage. So MCS 90 reimbursement claims uh, in most situations are, are the most underutilized and one of the most uh, un unused, unpursued claims that we see in the insurance industry. Uh, these claims are often ignored and not pursued by carriers due to the low chance of recovery. Uh, the idea of pursuing an uninsured entity or even among some carriers, the disapproval of pursuing your own insured. Uh, in fact, a lot of carriers we see actually just write off these claims. You know, they, they underwrite these policies, they pay out under MCS 90. When it comes to actually pursuing repayment from the insured, uh, they shut it down and waive the claim. Understand that these MCS 90 reimbursement claims are based upon a purely contractual right of reimbursement that allows the insurance carrier to pursue a claim for repayment of the amounts issued to an injured party injured third party on behalf of the insured through MCS 90. Uh, the reimbursement language reads, and this is included in the endorsement, that the insured agrees to reimburse the company for any payment made by the company on any account of any accident, claim, or suit involving a breach of the terms of the policy and for any payment that the company would not have been obligated to make under the provision of the policy except for the agreement contained in this endorsement. Accordingly, this right to reimbursement is very simple, contract-based, and totally self-explanatory. If payment is made under MCS 90, then the insured has an obligation, a duty, and owes the insurance carrier for those funds. The difficulty here is that usually these carriers don't have any money to reimburse, and it's not worth pursuing. Um, an example here for JT Trucker, going back to our good friend, uh, would be, uh, let's consider when uh, Truck and Stuff paid out the $250,000 to Patty Plaintiff and ABC under the MCS 90 endorsement. Uh, for the sake of this example, let's imagine that Joe Trucker somehow had his luck turn around, locked down a major contract right following the accident, and brought in a significant and high profit for that year. Truck and Stuff, their subrogation team and department recognizes that JT Trucking now has some assets 
and they have the ability to pay at least a portion of the amount that was paid out under MCS 90. Accordingly, they assert a reimbursement claim against their insured. Uh, they send a demand letter citing the reimbursement provisions and then threaten to file suit against JT Trucker for the amount owed in reimbursement. JT Trucking realizes that this is a total headache, seeing that the contract is valid and very much enforceable, agrees to pay $100,000 to get rid of this and have a full and final release. Accordingly, Truck and Stuff has cut some of their losses and found a nice payday on this reimbursement claim. Uh, remember, if JT Trucking decided not to settle, a suit could be brought and you can sue your own insured under this endorsement. Uh, which leads us to the next discussion. This example here, it's great, JT Trucking came into some money, but practically speaking, uh, it's not usually the case that those companies are gonna have those funds. Uh, the nature of MCS 90 claims make these claims for reimbursement in inherently just very tough to pursue. Typically, MCS 90 is paid out when a trucking company has the inability or just unwillingness to actually pay for a judgment against them and for the underlying claim. If they had the money to pay this, then the insurance company would never have been involved and they would have been able to walk away. Uh, further, many of these companies, by the time that MCS 90 funds are paid out to Patty Plaintiff or to ABC, uh, the trucking company that caused the loss is already closed, is already reincorporated in another name. So uh, acting quick is important. Remember that despite the difficulties with these claims, uh, we always tell clients that they should never be ignored. Uh, we've had many, many uh, six-figure recoveries on these cases, great recoveries, despite the fact that uh, they're inherently not the easiest to pursue. So always look into the corporate structure, uh, see whether the company is still in operation through FMCSA filings, uh, whether they've changed ownership, uh, whether they've uh, formed a new LLC or just gone out of business. Uh, and this leads us to another thing that we like to consider, which would be what happens when Joe Trucking transitions to JT2 Trucking, changes their assets over, or somehow changes business operations to uh, make it so that they can't be pursued. Uh, this brings us to the long-held legal doctrine that we like to mention in these presentations of piercing the corporate veil. Uh, the general idea of piercing the corporate veil, veil is when a claim may be brought against an owner or a successor organization despite it being incorporated in another name. Uh, for example, if JT Trucking came upon money and changed ownership chip to JT2 Trucking solely for the purpose of avoiding reimbursement, uh, then most jurisdictions in the United States would allow us to overcome corporate formalities and pursue JT2 or even Joe Trucker personally for these amounts owed. Uh, each state has very different rules in regard to how, when, and where you can pierce the corporate structure. Uh, so each claim should be reviewed differently. However, some common examples that you'll see in most states would be uh, the ability to pierce the corporate veil when there's fraud involved with the reorganization, uh, when the reorganization is solely to avoid a debt, or when the owner is uh, found to be commingling business and personal assets. He's uh, pulling funds out of the business account to pay for his own expenses and so forth. Uh, this is a very heavy topic that I do like to mention because it's very important for these claims, uh, but I could speak for a full you know, two or three webinars on this one. So for more information, uh, you can always reach out to me, but also I have recently published an article in Claims Journal titled Following the Money, Subrogating MCS 90 Payments Against an Uninsured Operator. So I'd ask you to take a look at that and uh, review further if you have questions. Uh, another thing that's necessary to mention is always keeping in mind that you should consider if there's any other parties to pursue. Uh, subrogation claims and reimbursement claims are all about creativity. You, know, you, are, you have to be the plaintiff's attorney. You, know, you have to be creative, you have to make your claim and assert your claim and uh, review, are there any other parties down the line? Negligent brokers, are there shippers? Are there other parties that should have contributed or may have had initial exposure that weren't involved? Uh, the complex nature of interstate trucking means that there are often numerous companies involved with the shipment of just one uh, load of cargo or some goods. So you need to take the time immediately upon opening a file for both MCS 90 subrogation and reimbursement to actually obtain 
all bill of ladings, and so forth. To wrap up the reimbursement issue, a few final tips and tricks for handling these claims. Uh, make sure that you have knowledge and resources available to conduct asset searches. Uh, more than just standard subrogation claims uh, and other reimbursement claims, claims against trucking companies involving these underfunded companies really require you to have the ability to search and find a deep background on these companies. Uh, you should have software in order to find what type of assets they have available whether you can pursue them. You should know where to look for FMCSA filings, be ready to send public records requests and so forth. And also you should have a network of investigators that you can retain for larger claims when you actually need somebody on the ground to go look into these things. Uh, MCS 90 claims could be you know, $750,000, $5 million. So it's important to have the people in order to go out there and see uh, whether there's anything to pursue. Uh, second, engage trusted legal counsel. Uh, a good attorney is a good attorney, but there's a level of specialization with trucking losses that needs to be considered. And we always suggest that for cases in this complex area of law, you know, all counsel is not the same. Uh, all subrogation counsel is not the same. So be sure to take your time, select your attorneys carefully and be absolutely certain that those attorneys that you work with in regard to MCS 90 or other more obscure transportation issues, uh, know their stuff and actually focus on these issues. Uh, further, remember that these recoveries in many situations uh, can be deemed a windfall. Uh, the top five recoveries I've had in regard to MCS 90 claims have been with cases that were initially either closed by the subrogation team or rejected by other attorneys. So we need to look deep into these things and keep it in mind. And now with the, the, at the top of our head, review all of our files accordingly. And finally, the last thing I like to mention is that there are also many state-based public financial responsibility rules and regimes similar to MCS 90. Uh, we don't have time to touch all, on all of this, but suffice it to say, that certain states require those trucking companies operating just intrastate in that one state to have certain levels of responsibility uh, through a Form F endorsement or another type of endorsement similar to MCS 90. So even for those accidents that occur in one state, when you have a trucking company causes an accident based upon their negligence and the claim is denied for lack of coverage, always consider try to get that policy whether there's any external or additional coverage that could be allowed through MCS 90. And that is everything. Uh, MCS 90 in a nutshell, I, I hope that you found this enjoyable. I do apologize for the uh, nature of jumping back and forth on the issues. It's a very complex topic and something that is uh, relatively difficult to cover in a 45-50 minute period. But now that we have a couple minutes, I'll answer one or two questions and announce our lucky trivia winner. Uh, it looks like our, uh, we have the trivia winner is Zachary McKenna with Corvell Corporation. Uh, con congratulations. Um, and the answer to your question, the question of what is the state that has the highest number of fatal accidents involving trucks? Uh, the answer here is Texas. Um, Texas is a, you know, obviously a very large state. Uh, there is a lot of trucking that occurs throughout the state of Texas. I'd say probably about 80% of our MCS 90 claims that we see for reimbursement uh, are in Texas. So uh, great answer there. Um, let's see, do we have any questions here? I think we have time to get to one. Uh, let's start with, uh, Katie in Arizona, she, asked, she states that our company writes trucking policies and we pay out under MCS 90. Uh, at this point, we don't really pursue reimbursement against the insured. Uh, how do you suggest we handle these claims and is it worth pursuit? Um, Katie, the, yes, the answer is you should absolutely always be pursuing reimbursement claims um, vigorously. 
Uh, we've seen some major recoveries and typically with a quick asset check, we can determine whether that company is gonna have anything worth pursuing. We can review the, uh, the corporate entity and the individuals. I mean, see if there's any property owned. Obviously, uh, tractors and trailers are, can be very expensive. So if we see a trucking company that has eight or nine tractors or trailers are still in operation, and you, let's say you have a $100,000 uh, MCS 90 reimbursement claim, uh, that's something that's absolutely worth pursuit. Uh, in the same light, uh, usually if we review those issues and find the company has been out of business for uh, four years, three years, uh, the company only had two trucks to begin with, uh, one of them was leased on, not so much. So the answer is always pursue these claims, have a system set up through the carrier to do so, um, but that doesn't always mean that you're gonna pursue every claim to the fullest extent. Um, we should have time for one more question. Uh, we have Mark in Wisconsin. Uh, Mark says, I have experience asserting claims against trucking companies across the country. I have noticed that many adverse adjusters and even their attorneys have no idea how the endorsement works. Uh, do you have similar experience with underinformed parties? Uh, yes. Uh, Oftentimes, we see that uh, insurance carrier, the adjusters for the actual insurance carrier who has the MCS 90 endorsement, uh, either doesn't understand how the endorsement works or applies, or just doesn't see coverage. Uh, I don't know if that's based upon the fact that it's, it's usually purposeful, or if it's just that they don't have these claims brought against them as often as they should due to the lack of knowledge on the other side. Uh, but in the end, we see it all the time, and that's why I suggest all adjusters who handle auto claims to take the time to listen to these presentations, to research these issues, and to also just have together some sort of standard memo outlining what MCS 90 claims uh, are and how it applies. The language is always the same in almost every policy, um, so it should be very easy to have standard form language. And that is all the time we have for today. Um, thank you all for attending. If you submitted a question and we haven't gotten to it, I will be certain to get back in touch with you within the next uh, day or two. And feel free, if any issues come up, if you ever have any questions, uh, give me a call, send me an email. I'm more than happy to be a resource to you. Uh, thank you all very much for attending. And uh, this is the end of our presentation today. Subrogation magic, creating something out of nothing, MCS 90 claims uh, and endorsements. Thank you.